so looking at the chapter, uh, so what we cover today will be today, uh, what we covered this week will correspond most closely to sections 5.5 and 5.6. And in fact, um, it aligns much more with the section 5.5. And uh, if there's one single section that's most important in this entire chapter, it would probably be this middle section. And uh, we get into it a little bit more than what your textbook does. Now, one bright side about this particular textbook is it emphasizes the geometry of space-time more more so than other textbooks that I've seen. So that actually means there's a more written material that um, that I'm not used to seeing in lower division uh, physics textbooks that I used to have to write up notes of my own and lecture on my own to cover that those important material. That's actually covered here. So, so I'll highlight that in a little bit. But for this overview, I want you to actually do it in a slightly reverse order because um, uh, yeah, slightly reverse order, but <laughs> let me go. This far down in section 5.5, the Lorentz transformation, it, uh, the most important thing that it covers here is the Lorentz transformation. So this Galilean transformation, that's a, a way to introduce a Lorentz transformation by connecting it to something familiar that you have seen in your earlier physics class. If, if you haven't seen it explicitly, at least you can make a sense of how this relates to what you have seen. Now, Lorentz transformation is the new transformation law that's uh, consistent with special, uh, uh, the second postulate of special relativity. The Galilean transformation, it's not consistent. So um, it took a lot of, not a lot, maybe two smart people <laughs> sometimes to figure out this transformation law. <laughs> and um, both in your text, well, maybe not in your textbook. I prefer to simply just state the Lorentz transformation. So, um, so this is the Lorentz transformation. And there's a way to state it, it so that it looks a little bit more symmetric. Um, and in the end, really what matters is that this is the transform. <laughs> Deriving it is a uh, more work. And this is, and you will hear me say this a uh, couple more times. There are certain things where the end result is uh, simply so much simpler than the derivation that goes into it. So without derivation, we'll just use the end result. And Lorentz transformation is one of those. So, and um, I, and there are deep um, aspects of Lorentz transformation that, that both the section gets you into and, and I do in the lectures. Now, before we get into those uh, deeper aspects of Lorentz transformation, one thing I want to point out is that you will see it in the lectures that I very much eschew what your textbook calls relativistic velocity transformation. As in, um, I avoid it, not in the sense that I don't, well, I, so I guess I don't lecture on it. Um, you do have homework questions that you have to answer for this. So you do have to read through it. What I avoid is I don't, so your textbook drives the relativistic transformation of velocity. And they go, you know, go through this calculus stuff, and they go as far as to drive these formulas for how the velocity components are transformed. Do they have the other version where you start out with the? the um, let's see, they might not be giving you the other version. So, well, if you want the other version, then you can easily get it from here. So, if you want to know the velocities in the prime, the coordinate then um, the easy thing to do is you can actually swap the unprimed with the primed, just switch V with the minus V. Um, <laughs> then it should work out, right? Um, so, so these formulas, um, I do expect you to know it. You do have homework questions that require you to use this to answer it. But I don't like covering velocity transfer transformation for this very simple reason. When you look at the Lorentz transformation, once you get used to it, uh, this is the kind of Lorentz transformation that you see with the infinitesimal version. 
there is a um, uh, simplicity to it. Uh, it involves factor gamma, it involves the speed, and there's some uh, symmetry to it. You can see that symmetry in how the time and position coordinates transform. And the way I like to write, um, and you see in recorded lectures, that symmetry is even more obvious than how you see it here. And that simplicity has a reason. Uh, Lorentz transformation is the transformation that defines the quantities we are going to call four vectors. Um, and uh, the position four vector is only one of uh, many four vectors that you will see that are useful for uh, doing work in special relativity. And velocity, I will tell you, is not a four vector. Uh, it is, I think, uh, uh, so for the velocity to be four vector, this should be proper time and it's not. And long story short, this uh, formula that describes the velocity in the way we usually understand them, it doesn't describe a four vector. That's why these transformations frankly look ugly. Um, and you know, compared to how the position length transforms, the X component transforms, and then in the Position, case of position, y and z components are left alone. But in case of velocity, y and z components are not left alone. They also have to be transformed. And so, so this is one of those where the it involves ugly formulas <laughs> and uh, it doesn't really have a deeper fundamental understanding of physics tied to it other than, you know, you should know how to use these formulas. So you do have a homework questions where you do have to, I think I focus mostly on the parallel components. I don't think I have any homework question that makes you deal with a perpendicular component. Um, so, so you have some homework questions where you have to use this formula and then I would just leave it there and I would leave it at this overview video and I won't really do any more lectures on velocity transformation because um, I feel like that, um, cost benefit isn't there. The amount of time you might put into covering velocity transformation and the kind of things you get from it. Um, and when we get to special relativity dynamics, when we look at collision of objects, a lot of the questions that you might be able to do using velocity transformation will end up doing uh, using the relativistic momentum and energy anyway. So, so that's next week. And <laughs> because we have other tools that I like better, I won't spend a lot of time on velocity transformation and this will be probably last time I talk about it. Uh, you should know where to look up the formulas though. So, so back to Lorentz transformation. Uh, so this is a long section and there's a good reason for it. They're covering quite a lot in this section. So um, let's see, what should I highlight? So Lorentz transformation is one and they might also write it down in the form that I like, which is, um, um, Uh, yeah, so they do eventually introduce beta. And, and this is the form that I like. And you will almost always see me consistently write it this way uh, with a slightly different order of uh, X and CT coordinates. Um, and yeah, in fact, yeah. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. Uh, your textbook does this in the place where it's describing Lorentz transformation with a rotation transformation. It's because um, both of these operations describe something that's geometric. When you are looking at a rotation of axis, that's obviously geometric. And um, I think there's a, something odd about talking about geometry when we are dealing with the time, but uh, there is, that's really the key insight in special relativity, that space and time as a one unified thing is something that obeys a certain geometric rules, um, which is a different set of rules than geometry governing space only. Um, you can see that in the key distinctions here. And, and, um, and your textbook goes as far as here. It, um, describes the geometry of space-time in the description here 
where they uh, define this quantity alpha. I think it's called the rapidity. Actually, I've seen ADA being used for this. Um, and because of the way text your textbook covers it, they are, um, so I think they are describing this alpha as almost uh, um, actual, just the physical angle. And um, they do say here, this differs from a rotation in the usual three-dimensional sense, insofar as two space-time axes rotate toward each other symmetrically in a scissors-like way as shown down here. And, um, and they describe this alpha as like a geometric angle. So um, the section 5.5, it um, this is probably one of the few lower division textbooks where I've seen a proper use of space-time diagram to illustrate uh, relativity of simultaneity and that might even be used to, to explain some paradoxes. And in fact, above where I scrolled through, your textbook did use a space-time diagram to illuminate some of the things that are going on with the twin paradox. So I would uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at this section. Um, uh, it really covers a lot. <laughs> it maybe should have been broken into two sections, but uh, it, it covers all the things you need to know about Lorentz transformation.